Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 30. This is on all manner of death, gods, and goddesses. What wisdoms can be gained from comparing, contrasting, uh, taking note of the syncretisms between the various mythologies, uh, religions, spiritualities of the world in regards to death, death gods, goddesses. We are going to be looking at ancient, modern, and all around the world. I do this for an hour, so give or take, of course. There's no way that I'd be able to touch on every culture, every belief there ever has been. Um, we've got a lot to go through, though, so I'm just going to get to it, really. Um, two things to start with. For one, we begin with the animistic idea, our first idea of death as an ancient culture, pre-religion, is that everything feeds into itself. It continues. Uh, nature is a wax and a wane. Things come in, things go out, things come back. Everything dies in the winter, comes back in the spring. There is a kind of eternal reoccurrence. This is the first belief. Um, we'll be referencing that at the end of this all. The other context, context that I need to establish is this term, psychopomps. And this comes from Greek, psychopompos which is literally meaning a guide of the souls. These are uh, either gods, demigods, spirits, and the like that guide spirits from death to the afterlife. This is a trope that we're going to see over and over again. They do not judge. They guide them. So when I say psychopomps, this is what I mean. So let's begin, speaking of Greek, with the Greek. This isn't necessarily the death goddess, but it is relevant. It is Nyx, N-Y-X, Nyx, which literally means night, the Greek goddess that is literally, literally the night, depicted anthropomorphically as a shadow figure. Nick stood at the beginning of creation. She is feared by Zeus. She is a big deal. And why I'm bringing her up is because she birthed relevant gods to this discussion. The night birthed death, which is called Thanatos. You hear Thanos somewhere in there, huh? a little pop culture reference for you. Thanatos is the son of the night of Nyx. Thanatos, or death, has brothers as well. Siblings, relatives. These relatives are Erobos, which means darkness, which is different than night. And Hypnos, which means sleep, like hypnosis. Huh? So death is related to sleep. There's some poetry there. Thanatos also has several other siblings, including Geras, meaning old age. Uh, I'm not going to say all the names. I'm just going to say the translation. Old age, suffering, doom, deception. <laughs> Moros, meaning doom. Uh, momus meaning blame, strife, retribution, nemesis, retribution, and of course, Chiron, which we'll talk, we'll talk, touch on more later. Uh, the distinction to be made here is that Thanatos is a peaceful death. So you can think of it as the god of peaceful death. Thanatos came to you. When it comes to a violent death, 
This is known as keres or ker. And these are female death spirits, goddesses who personified a violent death. You could see them on the battlefields. They don't have the power to kill, although they would be the psychopampos, the ones to collect what is killed on the violent battlefield. You can see them feasting on the dead. So this is a lot more metal. And already we're seeing that there's a, a bureaucracy or a, a, a tremendous complexity to death in the Greek mythos. Um, all of these keres, these, uh, you know, um, feeders on violent death, these goddesses are also daughters of Nyx and they're sisters to the fates or the morai. So the fates here are also relevant. Um, but not to get ahead of myself, the Greek word keres means death and doom as well. So you can see uh, it's also related to the terms plague, disease, blemish, or defect. You could also tie it to ravage or plunder, um, the destruction of the dead, or literally decay. So you might think, hey, this is very uh, re uh, spiritual, religious, kind of hard to relate to, you know, these, these uh, ghastly female figures that feed upon the dead. But think about it like this. This literally means decay. This is a mythic personification of the decay of dead bodies after they have been wounded. Thanatos, or regular death, would have simply just been the dead body that hasn't been filleted or what have you. You also have some weird extra notes here. I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, detail on a lot of them, but there's the um, Achilles or the Achilles, uh, which means the mist or the darkness. And this is literally a type of mist of death. Uh, you find it in the ancient cosmogenies. It was the eternal night before chaos. So this is a weird kind of enigmatic thing. An old Greek goddess likened to Nyx, not too far from the night, the eternal night. We also have Anthropos or Isa. This means without turn. And she is one of the fates. She is specifically the fate that cuts the cord to kill somebody. As some of you might know, there are the three fates. She is known as the inflexible one. She was um, the one who controlled when somebody's life ended in particular. So in this way, she's the one that causes death, right? So here's our whole lineup, right? There's one that causes death. There's one that collects the dead, right? And then there's one that brings them further. We'll get there though. This name Anthropos or Atropos is related and is used for the genus Atropa or, you know, Atropa Belladonna, meaning deadly nightshade, atropines. This is, uh, you know, medicine related to pharmacology. Um, I, uh, I have harbored a guess, you know, that it's related to uh, atrophy, you know, the, the act of losing muscle mass, um, atrophy literally coming from the word atrophia, meaning without nourishment. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot to dissect here on, on a wider scale. But of course, when I mention death in the Greek mythos, everyone's like, well, what about Hades, right? And Hades, in this case, is, uh, is a kind of a different story, right? You have the eldest son of the Titans, Kronos and Rhea, uh, brother to Poseidon and Zeus. And between the three of them, they divided the world. Zeus to the heavens, Poseidon to the sea, and Hades to the underworld, you know? So uh, this is an old trope that we're going to kind of be seeing more often with the others as well. But Hades is never uh, really seen outside of his domain. He's sort of depicted as a mysterious, stern, yet dignified creature, not devil-like whatsoever. Um, however, is not worshipped because there would be no offerings to satisfy Hades. 
prayers and sacrifices do not appease him. Um, so he's kind of hated by everybody because of the position that he has to play, but he doesn't play it maliciously. He does not torment the dead. They knew him as Zeus Kethonios, which means the infernal Zeus, the Zeus of the underworld. Um, those who received punishment in the afterlife did not get it from Hades. And mind you too, right? Hades is both the name of the man who rules it or the God that rules it and the place itself. This will be repeated. So <clears throat> you also see Hades referred to as Pluto or Pluton. This is uh, giving the lighter side that we don't often get of this deity. Because here it's more true to the ancient tradition, whereas Pluto or Pluton was viewed as the giver of wealth. And this is because of its association with growing of crops, that the winter needed to kill everything so that new crops could be grown. This is the beneficial side of death, again, hearkening to the old, old tradition. Here's a trope that we're going to see much later. Cerebus, or uh, yeah, Cerberus, the hellhound. For some reason, there's a dog in hell. We're going to see this again, again, and again. Trust me. Sometimes depicted with three heads, other times uh, a different amount of heads, sometimes with a snake uh, at the end of its tail, or a snake for a tail, born of echidna and typhon, a monster, right? And this uh, dog's duty is to prevent dead people from leaving the underworld, to protect the entrance of the underworld. Again, keep this in mind. This was taken so uh, truly by the Greeks that they would give the dead a honey cake that they would leave in their grave so that this person could gift Cerberus with a honey cake. <laughs> That's pretty cute. When it comes to the psychopompos of the Greek pantheon, it's Hermes. Above all, it's Hermes. Hermes would be the one to deliver the soul. And I know this is confusing, right? Because I've talked about the Keres, I've talked about Thanatos, um, but Hermes is the one that truly can take that cake. And then once they're there in the underworld, then we have. Chiron. And this is the one that most people know. It's the fairy man that brings the, uh, that brings the souls across the river Styx. And if somebody doesn't die with a coin on their eyes or in their mouth, then they can't pay the ferryman and they have to wander the shores for a hundred years before he'll let them pass. A coin to Chiron. This is a very, very old trope that would reverberate into the Roman era. So Chiron is not necessarily depicted evil whatsoever. He variates with, uh, in and out of stories in his likability and in his appearance. And I'm talking a lot about the underworld here, but there is Elysium in Greek mythology, which could be likened to a heaven but this is relatively undeveloped. And we see this will also be the case with many other religions, mythologies, so forth. So that, talking about the Greek there, sets a very interesting precedent to interpret the rest of what we're going to cover, okay? So we're gonna bounce around a lot, pre-warning, but right now we're going to look at the Sumerians. And the Sumerians in their mythology have Urshanabi, and Urshanabi is a ferryman of the Herber or the Huber River, the River of the Dead, equivalent to Chiron. See why I'm bringing this up. He is actually befriended in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, I'm not going to talk about him a lot because a lot of this information, digging this far back into a into a belief system brings about some enigmatic, hard-to-understand statements. For instance, uh, Urshanabi is collecting 
these unintelligible Urnu snakes in a forest. Don't know how to interpret that. And that his fairy is powered by unintelligible stone things of which Gilgamesh takes out and replaces with 120 stakes. Stakes, not snakes. Replaces the stone things. So there's some arcane references that I would have to devote a whole study to. But important part here, the ferryman, uh, you know, cross, letting the souls cross the river of the underworld is not alone in Greek. It is inherited somehow. Um, also in Sumerian, there is Ereshkigal, and this is the goddess of Urkala, meaning the underworld. She is the goddess ruler of the land of the dead. She controls the destiny of the deceased, the, the life beyond the grave. Legend uh, and myth and stories say that she is not there by choice, that she was taken and forced to rule there. She is um, literally the queen of the great earth. And the land of the dead is, is literally in her name, Erishkigal. And again, the underworld is uh, Kerr or Urkala. So just like with Hades, being the ruler and the place, you see this similarly in Sumerian. So <clears throat> when it says that she is lady of the great earth, this is more of a tie bringing it towards Gaia, bringing it towards the naturalness. And since it's earlier in human history, you'd see these references being more pertinent in Sumerian than you would in Greek, being that Greek is a long uh, deviation from Sumerian, which is a deviation from shamanism. But anyhow, the Greeks knew of her more arcane aspects, Arishkigal, that is, um, and they actually made her separated. So, not just Hades, but also Hecate. Hecate is also referred to as Hecate Arishkigal. And this is because of her use of incantations, her, her associations with witchcraft, and gestures to alleviate the fear of punishment in the afterlife. She is a mother type. So there's not as much fear in the afterlife by this account. Similarly, we also will have another trope here because she does not rule the underworld alone. That is also up to her husband, Nurgle. And Nurgle does get a quote in the Bible. This is 2 Kings 17.30. <clears throat> and the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth, and the king of Kulth made Nurgle. So, a literal reference here, which as we've discussed before in this class, usually the Bible reserved itself to mentioning uh, Canaanite polytheism, not Sumerian polytheism. But Nurgle did get adopted by the Babylonians. Nurgle is a solar deity, interestingly enough, not just a death deity. But over time, you see that it's only a reference to a certain phase of the sun. This would be the noontime of the summer solstice, which to the Mesopotamian society would be death season. This is when everything would burn out, nothing would grow. So in this society, the death season is the high noon of the summer solstice, where in most other societies, the death deity, or most other that I'm talking about, I should say, the death deity is associated with the peak of winter upon the winter solstice. So how the seasons work variate the characteristics of the death goddess or god. So interestingly enough, Nurgle is not just a solar deity, but also a god of war, tying him to Ares or Mars, and a god of pestilence. 
they called him the king of sunset. And like I've mentioned before, god of the underworld. Enlil and Ninlil gave him the underworld. Interesting. Or, you know, the netherworld. So, <clears throat> he is the top bureaucrat, the big boy, the one who stands at the head of the pantheon of the underworld. And it is like a government, just like the Greeks and their governmental bureaucratic underworld. Hades is on top. Well, here is Nurgle. Except, you know, Hades didn't have a wife, but Nurgle does. Eh. And that's, that's the theme that I want to establish right here, is that you have uh, mutual ruling deities, a husband and a wife ruling over something, not just up to one. That's where Greek does it different than many other cultures. Um, Nurgle would be ultimately done wrong in the, appropriate, in the appropriatization, in the Christianization of all of these different mythologies. And Nurgle would be turned into a demon um, aligned with Satan, yada, yada, yada. Just like Baal was turned into Beelzebub from the Canaanites. And here we go. We have to talk about the Canaanites. <clears throat> and this, all this is going to come up later. This is, this is a very intertwined talk. That's why I'm talking about so many cultures here. It's a big study, people. Uh, <clears throat> in Canaanite, the death god is Mat. And he is a prominent god, very prominent. One of the sons of El, god of death, doubt, and infertility. Now, Mat and Baal, Baal is the god of rain, equivalent to Zeus. Mat and Baal have a feud. They are brothers, but they have a terrible feud with each other. And that is because Mat is the beloved one, the favorite son of El, the creator deity. So the creator deity loves death more than rain, more than life. Interesting. And this makes Baal jealous. So in this feud, a few things happen. But Mott, in revenge, began to shower the world in drought, which is kind of a pun, right? Because he's the god of doubt. <laughs> and this killed Baal, killed the rains. And ultimately, Mott was. Uh, at the end of the story, killed, scattered his ashes, burned to death. So death was killed, interestingly enough, and rose again, desiring revenge. And they, Baal and Mott repeat this cycle over and over and over again. And this story is an allegory of the seasons. So the rain season dies and gives way to the drought season. And the drought season dies and gives way to the rain season. Or Mott kills Baal and Mott gets killed, you see. And this bleeds over into Abrahamic religions. This bleeds over into the Jewish tradition of Passover. In Passover, it's held at the end of the rainy season which symbolizes the death of Baal, or the, the rain god. And in the myth, in the Canaanite myth, Mot eats Baal like a lamb. And what do priests eat during Passover? They eat lambs. <laughs> they do not break the bones of the lamb, though, and this could be a reference to the fall. The festival seems to have started with the belief of the death of Baal or the pagan gods. And I've done a whole talk on this before. If you want to know more about uh, the polytheistic roots of, of Judaism and subsequently Christianity, uh, go to the Canaanite polytheism talk. But this name, Mat, is derivated several ways across Europe. But here we see it's also Mawet. And in the book of Jeremiah and in the book of Hosea, 
Mot is mentioned as a deity that Yahweh can turn over Judah to as punishment for worshiping other gods. Convoluted stuff. But anyhow, we're moving on. In Slavic paganism, of which I got to talk about recently, Mot worked its way down in its language and eventually became the death goddess in Slavic polytheism known as Mora, Morana, Morina, Mara, Marena, and Marzana. And I'm just going to say Marzana for, for the purposes of this. The goddess of death and rebirth of nature. Hmm. An ancient god or, uh, goddess associated with winter's death and rebirth and dreams. Curious. Death's association with dreams. Yeah, there's some poetry there too. She is, as I've mentioned, noted by many names, deviated from the term mar, more, signifying death. We still have this in the term mortal or mortality. And interestingly enough, this also ties to the word Mars, you know, the god of, of war. So again, here, make the connections, people. Nurgle, god of war and god of the underworld, right? Mott, god of death. Uh, Mars, god of war. Uh, Marzana, god, god, goddess of death. Right, you can see the syncretism. I, I hope, yeah, I hope you can see all the syncretism here. Now, moving away from that, I'm gonna do a lot of jumping around. And yes, I would love to go into her more. Over on the Celts, we have Morrigan. <laughs> Morrigan. And she represents the this balance between life and death, much like Morzana does. So there is in this goddess a understanding of the balance. And this is the old paganism, people. This is the old shamanism, that death means life, that life means death. They go together. It's a circle. It's a wheel. Morrigan means the great queen to, to the Celts. And she presides over both life and death. So this is a unique stance for a god or goddess to be in. And she is, especially because she is one of those uh, of few goddesses in um, this paganism, in Celtic paganism, that is a triple goddess. So one is Anu, which is the maiden of fertility. There is Badi, Bad, which is the mother cauldron, and Macha, which is the death crone. So, as a quick reference, in this old paganism, the crones, the wise old ladies, would be out in the woods, and boys would be sent out in their initiations, and whoever would go before them would die, they would kill the children, and they would walk away as men. So the idea of death here is very allegorical. It's not that these children would literally die in the way that we might think of it, but in a, in a very real way, they would die because through this initiation in society, they would now be understood as men. And this has a lot to do with the waning moon and the understanding of the crone, the old lady, being associated with death. Morrigan is husband and wife consort of the Dagda. And Dagda is kind of like the all-father, the Olathir. Um, this duo again represents just a powerful uh, a powerful union so she is both life and death and the dagda is um wisdom uh the magician and the esoteric end of things so their union is a, a grand allegory of all of existence really life death wisdom esoteric right okay Similar, no, not similarly. A note worth mentioning here is the Anko or the Ankoa. And this is in Celtic paganism as more of a folklore. And there are many different stories depicting this Ankoa, which is a man 
who is a skeleton wearing a cloak and wielding a scythe, described as a shadow, carrying a cart for collecting the dead. So this is one of the many origin stories that you can find for the modern depiction of the Grim Reaper. So right here, you can find it in Anko, or A-N-K-O-U. What's interesting about this, and this is another trope, take note here, they say that Anko is the first child of Adam and Eve. This is after Christianization. Or before Christianization, they said that Anko is the first dead person of the year. So it's this title that gets won in, this, in these ancient religions, that the first person who dies is the one that collects all the others who will die. This is not the only time that we're going to see this. But while I'm mentioning Christianization, why don't we hop over to the Abrahamic religions? So I'm not going to talk about Satan here. That's too on the nose. I want to talk about something more interesting. And this is Azrael, or the angel of death. This is most popular in uh, Islam. Um, and you can't necessarily know whether Azrael Ha, was um, around uh, or, or named before Islam. But this God, or not nah, God, I can't say that. This angel of death avenges those who have been wronged during life. So this is a retributive angel. And this is a major angel, one of the four. He is a psychopompos. He is a psychopomp. He takes the soul away from the dead body. You don't get this kind of detail in Christianity and all the Abrahamic religions that much. Azrael does not do this on his own and is informed by God. And it is said in the Islamic, you know, in the Islamic tradition that God drops a leaf from a tree of which Azrael picks up, reads the name, and goes to do. And in the same fashion, just like in Ezekiel's visions, just like all the weird, insane depictions of angels in these traditions, Azrael is described as having 70,000 feet, 400 wings, four faces, and the number of tongues that correspond to men inhabiting the earth. <laughs> oh, man. I'm not getting into that, but that is, that is rich with symbolism. But similarly, and if not the same, in the Hebrew tradition, not the Islamic, but more in the Hebrew tradition, we have Samuel or Samael, literally meaning the venom of God, the poison of God, the blindness of God. And this is more coming from the Talmud. And the, uh, I haven't got to touch on Jewish mysticism too much in this course, but this figure Samuel or Samael uh, is the accuser of, of Satan, I believe, and is also known as the, the seducer and destructor. So this is also an interesting reference to the left hand of God or, or the, uh, the darkness of God, or like it said, the blindness of God. And this gets into a level of cosmology that most people don't get from Christianity, Judaism, and the like. That's why I find this so interesting and so worthy of a mention. But this is not necessarily a fallen angel. This is a necessary function. So is it good? It, well, it's, it is good in, by this mentality, right? To have something that destroys sinners, to have an angel that destroys evil on the earth. So it's a destructive deity and thus the angel of death. And although uh, this angel does not give judgment, it's just following orders. So we get that bureaucratic vibe again, that 
the the deity the entity doesn't will to do this it just does what it needs to do and that's kind of grim reaper vibes right there but in these different traditions this gets kind of controversial it says that uh samuel engineered the fall of adam and eve with the snake in the garden of eden that it rode uh let's see He rode the serpent like a camel, is the quote. It is also said that Samael is the father of Cain, and you know, that whole Cain and Abel story, and that he is the partner of Lilith. So this is the this is like the conspirator or the like, you know, if God is a mob boss, then he has the one that does all his dirty work. <laughs> and that's Samael. Um, which I guess you could say that maybe is uh Azrael is just a different form of Samael or Samuel. But let's move away from that. That's a curious note. Look into that more if you're, if you're curious. Um, similarly to Christianity, as I've mentioned before in this course, is Zoroastrianism. And here we have a very different look at this whole afterlife scenario. And this is the Dana. And the Dana is both a deity and a concept which all deities are concepts and vice versa. But anyway, she represents revelation, consciousness. She is one of the yazatas, which are angels, divinity. Deena is a divinity. She is, a, she is the one that arrives to give a reward to the good person in the afterlife. She is the psychopomp. She is the guiding, the guiding figure of good souls after death, pure souls. She guides them over the Shabbat bridge, the rainbow bridge. Or if they're bad, right? She guides them to the, ho the house of lies. The wicked are dragged down to the house of lies, their place of punishment. And she is described as being finely dressed and accompanied by dogs. Hmm. Dogs being a guide in the afterlife. Gods being protectors in the afterlife. Hmm. So, so far we got one in, in Cerberus in, in the Greek tradition, and now we got two. We got the dogs in the afterlife of the Zoroastrian tradition. So that is an interesting figure because she's a guide to both. Deena is a guide to both. Consciousness is a deciding factor of whether you go up or down, to kind of translate that better. Brief note here, and we'll move to the Baltics. The Latvians named their death deity Vea Mate. And the Lithuanians named it Giltine. And that's kind of interesting, right? Giltine, almost not far from guillotine. Hmm. And guillotine was viewed, oh, 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 as an ugly old woman, long blue nose and a deadly tongue. The other legends say that guillotine was young, pretty, young and pretty until she was trapped in a coffin for seven years. Interesting notes there, you know, that could be a reference to decay. I should also mention in the Zoroastrian tradition, it's not a mainstream belief, but it's a, it's a side belief that if the, um, if Dinah appeared to you to bring you to the heavens, she would appear as a beautiful maiden. But if she would appear to you to bring you down to the house of lies or to the underworld, she would appear as a hag. And here in the Baltic religions, in the Baltic paganism, in this guillotine figure, we're also seeing that she is both depicted as a maiden and an ugly old hag, which this yet again, both of these hint to the maiden mother crone triple goddess archetype that you can also find in Celtic, Slavic, and all sorts of other paganisms, which all are a reference to the pre-shamanic culture before all religions. 
But anyway, her sister, Giltines, by the way, Giltines, I'm still talking about this uh, Baltic death goddess. Her sisters, what, her sister was the goddess of life and destiny, Lema. So their relationship being sisters is symbolic, directly referencing the relationship between death and life, the beginning and the end. So while death might seem grim, there's also the other sister, right? Yeah. So this imagery, this imagery of this goddess, the death goddess and her sister of life is that kind of mutual deification that you should pay attention to when looking at different ancient mythologies or modern religions. Um, notice in Abrahamic religions, there's not much of a discussion when it comes to the rebirth end of things. It's just get out. So we're, uh, uh, anyway, brief mention of the Norse people here. I just want to mention the Norse, uh, and I've talked about them before. I'm skeptical of Helheim. I'm skeptical that this depiction of hell is a retroactive change after uh because our our knowing of the norse mythology only came after christianization um so i have some doubts here but regardless even if i'm off the ball here hell is both the place and the deity that runs it much like uh hades and much like we saw in the sumerian tradition so there's three uh, both the place and the deity are the same thing. Literally. Literally, the underground is named as a place and is personified as a deity, anthropomorphized. I, I feel like I, I keep needing to reiterate that. But hell in Norse means hidden. That which is hidden. She, this is not a terrible place to be. It's just underground. <laughs> she says it does say that she cares little for those within her realm that's true but to to think of this place as hell like christianity's hell is way off the ball she is born of loki the trickster god so interesting to note that hell was born from tricks hmm hmm curious take that as far as you want so now we're jumping way across the world we're talking about the algonquin people and there's this figure known as mausumus and i know i'm pronouncing all these names wrong today i read things i don't i don't hear people tell me these things <laughs> this is the evil god of a twin pair the brother is gluskap and the brother is the great lord, is the good one, okay? Malsimus, or Malsum, is said to be literally translated as wolf, or an evil wolf, is, is depicted as an evil wolf. But this is contested, because this is a belief shared by more than one people. Now, the story goes that the creator god Talbadak or Tal Tabaldak created humans from dust in his hand. Or no no no, created human humans and from the dust of the creator's hand created Glooskab, which again, you know, the great lord and the twin brother. Another story says that both of these gods decided how they would be born. These twin brothers uh, decided how they would be born. And Gluskab came out the good way, the natural way. And Malsumus came out the side of his mother killing her. So Malsumus is this evil and trickery. He is the one that puts thorns on plants. In all aspects of nature where things go wrong, that is Malsumus. 
in all aspects of nature where things go right, that's Gluskab, protects man, uses his power to protect. And so death in this way is arranged by Gluskab, but ultimately, or not Gluskab, is arranged by Mausimus, the evil god, but is ultimately saved by Gluskab. So this is all a battle between the two. This, this is a, a, a sibling rivalry, that existence is a sibling rivalry. And that, that the, basically the good God is always going to do the right thing. And the trickster, the dark God, Gluska, or, or yeah, uh, Malsimus, is always going to try to outsmart him, but will always be outsmarted. So all of reality, all of duality here, you know, again, life means death, death means life, life means death, death means life. These are the twin brothers that run it all. So here's the pairing again, right? And this is likened to, again, the Slavic mythology with the white and black god. I think it's Chernobog and, and something else. Um, you literally see this exact same story in Europe in the Slavic tradition where there is the beneficent, good, light God that is always going to do the right thing, and then the one that tries to trick him and that ends up ruining everything, and this is the black God. And they just, that's how they do. So tying those two traditions again, another account of, another account of the mutuality between life and death again, of the duality of life, of how birth necessitates death Yada, 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 yada. So let's move down into different depictions. The Mayans and the Aztecs are rather hardcore. I haven't got to talk about them a lot throughout this course. Um, but a brief mention of the Mayan here is this Apu, a Apuk or Apach, the god of death, darkness, disaster, depicted as a skeleton in its bloated state of decay. So literally, this is hardcore, man, this is metal. In the advanced stages of decomposition, so still having this like wriggling ma uh, maggoty flesh. And Apach ruled the lowest and most feared realm of the underworld called Mitnal. And the Mayans would be very reluctant to even speak this name because of how terrible the mythos and lore around this dimension, what have you, is. This is where people will be brought to be tortured, slaughtered, dismembered for eternity, and so forth. I bring this up for a few reasons. For one, the depiction of the god of death here is an act of decomposition, the literalizing of it. Also, doesn't seem far off from the Grim, Grim Reaper vibes or the Anku vibes that we saw in the uh, Celtic tradition. So curious synchronicities here, but it also sets the tone for how, like, how evil evil could get when it came to the South Americans. Now, the ones that we're going to spend more time on are discussing the Aztecs when it comes to this particular session. And again, apologies for all my pronunciations. But first here, we have Miklantec... McLanticuddle, McLanticuddly, McTanlicultly, <laughs> King of Mictlan. This is the god of the dead and king of Mictlan, the lowest realm of the underworld. So again, we have a deity that rules the underworld. This is the husband, one of the prominent gods, again, just like Hades, god. No, this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ceremonial rites in his honor would be cannibalization and all manner of death around the temple. Skeletal imagery is, in the Aztec culture, a uh, symbol of health, abundance, and fertility and the balance between life and death. It's interesting, right? Because the bones are what make you alive, but the sight of them means death. 
So this balance of both, right? The bones of the world. Uh, so this is hardcore when it comes to the different sacrifices, the acknowledgments of the underworld God, the God of the dead um, in Aztec uh, mythology. And interestingly enough, this under this, uh, I'm going to try to say it one more time, Mick, Micklin Tecotl, or Mictanacoltli, was associated with spiders, bats, and owls. So let's dissect that a little bit. The spiders and bats clearly live in the underworld, right? They literally live in caves and in the darker recesses of the earth, right? That's very, very literal. But owls, owls are a bit different because owls are a totem. Owls have always been a totem for death or rebirth or transformation in some form. And this is because of their attraction to hanging around ruins. When a town is destroyed, owls like to hang out there, take it over. Or when a barn is derelict, that's where they like to hang out. And so this is the old totem of the owls and thus why the god of death is associated with the owl. Which, you know, that gives uh, weird associations with the cremation of care in California and the Bohemian Grove. But anyway, this god of the underworld also has a wife, Mictecacotl. Mictecacotl. Got that one better. Or, yeah, Swaddle. Literally the lady of the dead, the queen of Miklan, the underworld, and the afterlife. Um, she is the one that watches over the bones of the dead and presides over the ancient festival of the Day of the Dead. This is the original death goddess that the Day of the Dead is paying homage to, of which would be inherited by the Spanish traditions. Now, the Lady of the Dead was said to have been sacrificed as an infant. So again, we have that weird trope of being, of dying very early on makes you in charge of the dead in some way. We're finding that across the world. And she was represented with a jaw agape, like an open jaw that swallowed the stars during the day. So the goddess of the underworld swallows the stars during the day so that they only would appear at night when she reigns. Now, there's a lot more mythology to dig in here that makes it more interesting as well. But I want to say and I want to emphasize here that I'm talking about a god and goddess of the underworld that seem rather dark. But in Aztec cosmology, lore, mythos, <clears throat> they have opposites. A couple, Amakadal and Amakatli, which are the givers of life. So everything in balance here, yet again, we're finding this in the Aztec as well. It's not all doom and gloom. But something that I find really curious here is Hadl or Skadl. And this is a god of fire and lightning that is depicted with a dog head and was a guide for the dead. Hmm, a dog who is a guide for the dead. <clears throat> Sadl is a twin brother of Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl is just, that's just an offhand reference, um, is the serpent, the fiery, or the fiery serpent or the serpent deity that I got to mention in the mythology of snakes talk. So here's just tying those two together. Sadl, this canine god, guide of the dead, his job was to protect the sun from the dangers of the underworld. So by the thought of the old Aztec, right? The sun sets and goes into the underworld. So what protects it there? The, this canine god, Sadl. This god is the personification, the dark personification of the evening star or of Venus. So there's some more arcane references there. Associated with the heavenly fire, again, being that he protects it when it's in the underworld. 
this is also an act of recreation of life that every night when Sadl guides the sun through the underworld, right? So here it is, a direct reference to the cycle. The sun comes up over the horizon. It's alive. It goes and dips under the horizon. It's in the underworld. It's dead. But then it comes back. It comes over again, and it's alive. And Sadl is the one that would guide you while you're on the under. So this is literally like a full-on psychopomp. This is a full-on psychopompos, a guide of the dead. And you literally see that there is a, 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 an actual dog, a Mexican hairless dog that is named after this deity. It's, <laughs> I mean, when you look at this dog, you really feel like it should be a deity. And that this breed dates back uh, at least 3,500 years. So again, dog of the underworld. That's our third reference there. So what does that say about where all this stuff is coming from? Hmm? <clears throat> Hop across to Egypt. And who do we got? We got Anubis, right? God of the dead, tombing, embalming. And Anubis has the body of a man and the head of a jackal. Huh. Hmm. Doggish, maybe? A little, little doggish? <laughs> Which, mind you, they found co cocaine leaves, cocaine, in Pharaoh's chambers. So there had to have been some conversation between these two peoples. You know, South America and Africa. But that's, that's, you know, that's not in the, that's not in the textbooks. Anyway, <clears throat> when someone died, Anubis would guide them to the underworld. So Anubis is the cycle pomp, but ultimately they'd be handed over to the god of the underworld, Osiris. So in that same way, right? We've seen that analogy quite a few times by now. So Osiris is the eldest god or the eldest son of the, the union between the sky goddess and the earth god. So we've seen that a few times too. It's clear that the underworld will be born of those two. Now, when, when Osiris became the ruler of Egypt, became the pharaoh, his brother Set got jealous murdered him, locked him in a coffin, sent him down the Nile. They literally stitched him back together. The gods came together. His sisters came together, literally stitched him back together. And since that point, Osiris became the ruler of the underworld. So yet again, we have a, a rivalry between these brothers, between things that represent different seasons, right? What does Osiris represent? Oh, and there's this battle between Set or Sunset, right? I'm not getting down that road. I only have so much time. So another dog-headed god and also another reference to this battle between brothers and how a person gets assigned to the underworld. Now we're hopping across and we only got a few more here. It's all worth it. Trust me. We're hopping over to Hinduism now. This is a very different note because we have the Yamadutas. And they are messengers of death. So this is unique. They tell people that they're dead. They're there. They show up to tell you that you're dead. And that they will take you to the afterlife. So these are a kind of minor, minor deification, a kind of spirit that is sent to guide you. And that's their sole duty. And they're saying Yama Dutas. So who are they bringing them to? They're bringing them to King Yama. <clears throat> and King Yama has been depicted all over Asia and anime. Um, but King Yama in the Hindu tradition is the god of death, justice, and dharma. And Yama is considered to be the first mortal who died. Hmm. <laughs> he has a twin sister named Yami, who, uh, who is the deity of morals and duty, self-control and forbearance. He is depicted as having storm cloud skin. 
but is um, almost wrongly depicted more often with blue or red skin. So <clears throat> Yama is the son of the sun god and, and son of the goddess of dusk. Interesting, goddess of dusk. Hmm, what, what, what kind of allegory could that have with death, right? Take it as far as you want it. So he helps you in the afterlife find a place to be. That every person needs to have their own path. And he will choose the unique path for you. Now, if you are somebody who deserves punishment, he is depicted as somebody who's carrying a stick or a mace, you know. And that's the intimidating side. But you will be sent where you respectfully belong in the Hindu tradition in this way. And that he is in different stories depicted as a teacher. So this underworld, you know, this death god, this one seems much more uh, agreeable, relatable, beneficent. Now in this tradition too, you also have a ferryman. This is Tarashkewawa or Tarashkewara or Tereskevara. And this is a form of the god Shiva. And this is a ferryman that delivers your soul to moksha. So they're not delivering you to rebirth. That's King Yama. King Yama will eventually send you to rebirth. If you are escaping the mortal coil, if you are reaching nirvana, if you are breaking out of the matrix, man, if you are achieving moksha, then you will meet the ferryman, Tereshkawara, the form of Shiva that will let you across the river into moksha. Curious twist on that, huh? And that's an old belief. We're going to hop to the ones that adopted a lot of the King Yama stuff through Buddhism and so forth to Japanese. And this is, I'm, I'm talking more anime here, people. The gods of death, or more like the spirits of death, the Shinigami. And the Shinigami only became more popular or referenced after the war. After the, uh, the native Japanese people came into contact with Western society. You could say that this is because they were shown depictions of the Grim Reaper and, uh, and subsequently were inspired to create death deities. But I think it's a lot sadder than that. I think that the Japanese people really had little reason to obsess over death until they met the Western people, which I, that's why I think it's sad. Now, when they thought of the Shinigami, they were sort of like these inhabiting spirits that would cause people to die in the same places repeatedly. So some people might know about the suicide forest. This is an act of Shinigami that somebody becomes possessed or listens to these dark thoughts in their head that ultimately leads them to the same places to die. So Shini Gami. Shini um, literally uh, is... Shinigami is literally translated as death spirits or evil spirits, and they are more like ghosts than anything else. You can't quite call them gods. They'll inhabit the thoughts, making people want to die or do bad things. They are invisible unless you yourself are close to death. So this is ra rather dark, you know, and it's more soft. It's not quite this deification that we've been seeing all along the way. I just wanted to throw that one in as an interesting side note because I've wanted to talk about Shintoism for a long time, and this is my one opportunity. Now, lastly, here's another new one that I haven't got to talk about. The Igbo people of southern Nigeria, and the belief system here is Odinani. And in Odinani, they have a goddess a very, very respectful, important goddess named Allah. And she is the deity of earth, mortality, fertility, and creativity, beneficent. Allah rules the underworld. All of the deceased ancestors are in her womb. Her name, Allah, literally means the ground. 
She is literally the ground. The ancestors are in her womb. Her husband is the sky deity. Do you see how? <laughs> you guys have to be seeing the syncretism. All ground is holy ground to the Adonani believers, to the Igbo people. She is uh, praised for everything that grows out of it. And she has a messenger. The messenger is a snake. Hmm. Now that's a curious twist on some other mythological stories. The earth goddess's messenger is a snake. The caring earth goddesses, the protecting earth goddesses messenger is a snake. This is Africa, people. She is symbolized by the crescent moon. Made in Mother Crone. And again, the souls of the dead reside within her sacred, her sacred womb. And that all will go to Allah. All will go to the earth. Where they came from, they'll all go back to the earth. They do have another god for punishment. This is Ag this is Agbenabali. Agbenabali. Agbenabali? He kills at night. This is the death deity. And this is victims that have committed heinous acts, broken taboos. So there is retribution in these very old beliefs that there is a, there is a deity to take care of you. But not everybody needs to go down there. You see, it used to be more like this way, way back. And to continue this note of what has retained in these ancient approaches to death, we look at the Philippines, which, by the way, the Philippines and these ethnic religions have shamans that are not just mostly women, which again harkens to the whole Paleolithic shamanism, but are most notably trans women or hermaphroditic which is a whole other gambit topic that i haven't got to touch on but note that and for them this ancient beliefs of the philippines and east asia in general the idea is of the anito similar word interestingly enough but this is a reference to the ancestor spirits to the nature spirits and the and these spirits are the guardians of a family, but they also come to you at death and have you travel to the spirit world by boat. Hmm, by boat. Maybe you'd need a ferryman for that. You see, this is that originating stuff, people. So accounts on what the spirit world and location varies, but it depends on how you died. It depends on how old you were when you died. It depends on how quality of a person you were when you were alive. And so there is no idea of heaven and hell in this way. It's crafted to you. It's crafted to who you are. You go where you're fitted. You go where you're fitted. And that you go to an other world that exists simultaneously with the material world and then later on religions would call it the underworld but the spirit world in this way is parallel in the ancient beliefs parallel to the material world and that eventually out of spending time there you would reincarnate again just like with the aztecs the sun dips down below the horizon line and it comes back up over the horizon line now, evil people do go to places that do punish them because that's what they necessitated through their own karma, through their own doing. But the spirit world, again, crafted for you. And even when you're in the spirit world, you have a certain influence on the material world. And just like we have a certain influence on the spiritual world here. We, in the shamanic tradition, you can see that this is very true. You invoke ancestor spirits for protection, for ceremonies, for advice. Um, and, you know, vengeful spirits show up in this world uh, as ghosts. 
that try to harm people. This is a literal way. And you see all these same tropes in modern day spiritualism. If you want to hear more about that, that's the very first talk I did on the Spiritual Studies channel. All of this stuff that I'm saying to you right now is exactly in line with spiritualism, which ties <clears throat> the ancient traditions to what's coming up in the new age. And when I say ancient, I mean ancient, ancient. So in this belief system, in the Philippines, in the ancient belief system prior to Christianization, your ancestors would be the ones that come to you to guide you into the next world. You have seen this in, in, um, in, in terminal lucidity in the modern day in hospitals. People experience this in NDEs and near-death experiences where they see people who have long been dead and they even see people that they don't know are dead but are actually dead that guide them. These others, these relatives of yours, are your psychopomposes. This is the original thought of death. And I hope me spreading out in all these traditions have shown you these different tropes, how they relate to each other, how they're unoriginal in many ways, and what the original idea was.